Um, so your next speaker is me. <laughs> into everything, I just really was touched by Alexander's story and just, you know, really want to give glory to God. So can you guys give him a hand and just Woo! It's been quite a transformation and I'm just really excited to talk with you guys about your own legacy and what's going to go on in your life. So, before I continue, I need to myself if you haven't, if you don't know me. Um, um, before we start, we can go ahead and give a word of prayer. So if you could please bow with me. Father God, we just thank you so much for this opportunity to come before you and just learn so much about the legacies that you are instilling in our lives. God, we just know that in this moment that you are here and you are present and you are moving and you are speaking to us. And so Father, I ask that any distraction, any tiredness, God, any brokenness, God, any um, lingering thought of an issue, God, just be gone. Jesus name, Father God, Lord, and that um, your presence just be so thick in this area, God, that we cannot deny your presence, Father God, Lord, that if these words are for someone, God, that they speak to them and speak to them richly, Father God, Lord, and to just, um, just skewer their hearts, Father God, Lord, and I just really ask, Father God, for the receptiveness of your hearts, Father God, Lord, mine especially as I give the word, God, and I just thank you so much for who you are, God, for what you have been doing, what you're doing right now and what you're really doing. And we just love you and thank you. Just want to pray. Amen. 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 Okay. So today I'm going to be talking about leaving a legacy of compassion. So before we start, yesterday we learned a lot of things from Pastor T. And now we're going to talk about your legacy and leaving a legacy of compassion. So I know we did this yesterday, but <laughs> I also was planning on doing this, so everyone say, I have a legacy. I have a legacy. With a little bit more conviction. I have a legacy. I have a legacy. Absolutely you do. And the most wonderful thing about this is that even if you think that you're not leaving a legacy, some of you are just like me when I was your age. I was like, uh, I'm just going to play Kingdom Hearts. I'm just going to hang out with yeah. friends. Did you guys scout Kingdom Hearts? Come on now. Anyways, so I'm just going to hang out with my friends. I'm just going to do my thing. I'm going to go to church. Um, but, the, but we do leave a legacy. We, there are things that we do that impact the lives around us. So this is how legacies are made. So we have us being impacted. So someone says something encouraging. Someone does something that inspires us. Like, for example, like if you're into music, someone writes a really great song that really gets you going, or like someone says something like, hey, like I really like how you do what you do, like you're a really great dancer, like you should get up there more. And you're like, all right, so you go out and you impact other people. You just go out and you do your thing. And then in doing so, you're also impacting other people. So this is the chain that creates legacies. Now, that means that legacy is the ripple effect that caused the caused by the things that we do or say to others. Now, how do we know what kind of legacy that we are to leak? A lot of times we're just like, ah, like I don't know what I'm really good at, like I don't know who I am or like what I'm doing. But God actually does <coughs> show us. So in 1 Corinthians 12, 14, 11, it says here. Um, if you guys can read it with me. Now there are varieties of gifts with the same spirit. And there are varieties of service with the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities with the same God who empowers them all and everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the spirit for the common good. For to one is given through the spirit the utterance of wisdom. And to another is the utterance of knowledge according to the same spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by the Holy Spirit. To another, the working of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, the ability to distinguish between spirits. To another, various kinds of tongues. To another, the interpretation of tongues. All these are empowered by one and the same Spirit, who apportions to each one individually as he wills. And then our next verse. 
1 Peter 4, 10, each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in these various forms. So we know that compassion is, oh, so we know that we are given a gift. Everyone has it. Whether you're a good dancer, you're a good chef, whether you're a good speaker, whether you're a good singer, everyone has something that God has given them. So what has spoken to me is that God has given me the gift of compassion. And a lot of this um, just stems from Christ himself. Um, so in, in the Bible, so there's this Greek word called... Who wants to try saying this? <laughs> okay, Esther, how do you how do you think it should be said? <laughs> That's a good guess. So <laughs> it is splag 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 mitsoma. It is a Greek word to which means to be moved with compassion, and its main origin comes from the Greek word. I don't actually know how to say this one because there wasn't a pronunciation for it. So I'm just going to say splanchina. <laughs> and it means your guts. So it means your intestines in the very seat of your emotions. So how many of you guys have heard when someone says, oh, I got a gut feeling or it's heart-wrenching or just, I just have this ugh in my, in my feelings. Like, sometimes you just have that moment where you're just like, oh, I have, I have this deeply seated feeling of movement towards something. And so, there are many examples of this. Two of the examples come from these verses. So the first verse is the resurrecting of Lazarus. So it says here, now when Jesus came, he found that Lazarus had been already in the tomb for four days. Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off, and many of the Jews had to had come to Martha and Mary to console them and concerning their brother. So when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him, but Mary remained seated in the house. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, comforting her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, Please, I know that you will rise again in the resurrection of the last day. <laughs> Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he should die, yet he should help, but yet shall live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? She said, Yes, Lord. I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is coming into the world. When she had said this, she went and called her sister Mary, saying in private, The teacher is here, and he is calling for you. And when she heard it, she rose quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not come into the village, but was still in the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews who were with her in the house consoling her saw Mary rise quickly and go out, they followed her, supposing that she was going to the tomb to weep there. Now when Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come with her also weeping, he was deeply moved. He was moved in his very gut. And he said, Where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. So the Jews said, see how he loved him. And after that story, that we have another one, but surprise or spoilers, Lazarus does rise again. So the next story is, soon afterwards, he went to the town of Nain, and, the, and his disciples and a great crowd went with him. As he drew near to the gate of the town, behold, a man who had died was being carried out the only son of his mother, and she was a widow, widow, and a considerable crowd from the town was with her. And when the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her and said, Do not weep. Then he came and touched the bier, and the bier bearer stood still. And he said, Young man, I say to you, rise. And the dead man sat up and began to speak, and Jesus gave him to his mother. 
Pharisees in the law, and they glorified God, saying, A great prophet has arisen among us, and God visited his people. And this report about him spread through the whole Judea and all the surrounding country. So now we know that even Jesus himself had felt that deep, deep compassion. He is the pinnacle and example of compassion in our lives. And compassion is the deeply felt conviction towards someone or something. So it's that moment when you see someone on the street and they're hungry or they're tired or they're broken. It's that moment when you look at a child and his ice cream's on the floor and he's upset and you're like, if that was my ice cream, I would be upset too. It's that knowledge of understanding that when people go through painful things that you don't turn away. How many of you, every single time, stop and stare or stop and talk to someone who's homeless who comes up to you. Anyone? I know I don't. Sometimes you do, some, some people say, oh yeah. But I know like a lot of times, because I work downtown in San Francisco, I'm like, nope, nope, sorry, don't have money. And then they're, but they're like crying out and they're saying like, please like help me feed me. And there's this mentality that we have inside of ourselves where we're like, like, I don't have time for this, or I can't do this right now, or it makes me uncomfortable. But that's the thing about compassion, is that it means we stare that issue right in the eye, and we say to it, how can God use me to change this situation? Whether it's a minor or a major change. And we see this in Jesus Christ through his ultimate example of dying on the cross for us. So John 3, 16 to 17. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. And oftentimes we forget that there's verse 17, that God did not come here to condemn us, but he came to save us. And the most important thing that we need to remember here that you guys are here at this camp to hear this message of just knowing how much you are loved and how much you are cared for by this God that sits at the throne and is looking at you and saying, yes, I want you. That he's looking at you and saying, yes, you are sinful. Yes, you deny me. Yes, you don't care right now, but I want you. And the proof is in the pudding, folks. You gotta know it. And how do we know this? It's because he sent his son to die. How many of you would send your own kids to die in place of the person you don't like? That person who's over there talking about you. That person who's over there who's looking at you and stealing your test papers. You know? <laughs> that person. Anyway. <laughs> um, we wouldn't. I'm not going to send out, I'm not even going to send out my adorable pug to go and die for you. That's really rude, but you know, at the same time, like, maybe I would, it would be really hard though. <laughs> um, but, but God sent his son, he did, the son that he loved, the son that he communed with, the son that he fellowshiped with, he sent his son in your place with the full intention, the full knowledge of watching him carry all the sin and all the separation <clears throat> For you. And God didn't have to do that for you. It's just the same way. Your mom doesn't have to make you a sandwich for lunch, but she does it anyways. And what's the reason for that? Because she loves you. And in the same way, God loves you. Not because he needed you, but because he wanted you. And he loved you so much more than he loved his own son. So he chose you first and said, yes, I will die for you. And that is the hugest example of love and compassion. Christ's example of sacrifice is the greatest example of love and compassion. Now, in our own lives, we experience these things as well. In my life, there is a little girl and a mother whom I love very dearly. I won't say their names. I will simply call the little girl BB because I call her my BB, and I will call the mom mom because I call her mama. Sometimes I call her hot mama. It depends on the day. Um, but in any case, um, it was my sophomore year of college, 
and it was a, it was a rough time. Um, there were a lot of things happening, and I needed to take a break. So it was the summer. I wasn't trying to do too much, but because of this deep depression, I just really felt like I could not do anything. That God just had no plan for me, and that I was just going to, you know, just sit around and live my life that way. Um, but God had other plans. One day I got a phone call from a friend, and he said to me, hey, there's this girl, um, I know you love kids, and like, I just need to tell you this story because we just, it's just so heart-wrenching. Um, but this little girl, her dad, he cheated on his on her mom, and now her mom and her are here, and there's a lot of things going on. And I don't even know how to say this, but he wants nothing to do with the little girl. He just completely abandoned them, and I just looked at them and I was just like, "Why well, didn't look at them?" I imagined them. And my heart just broke because I understood from my own experience what it meant to lose something so dear, something that you had to have so secure. And I just said, God, like, what do you want me to do? Like, I literally, I have more money. I am a girl college student. I can't do anything. Um, I'm not even that great at school. I'm not that great at like sports. Like, I can't like put this kid in daycare. But I am good with kids, so I guess you're calling me to watch her? And so I did. And so I took her into my home from 8 a.m. to 7 p.m. every single day for an entire summer. And I remember when I was driving in my car, I was talking to a friend, and he said, why are you doing this? Who on earth does this? Like, I get it, Chriselle. Like, you have a really soft heart and like you really care for the people around you, but you're literally wasting your summer. You could have an internship, you could be like going on vacation, you could be doing a lot of things right now, but why are you choosing to do this? And I looked him straight in the eye and I said, because this is exactly what God would do for me. If I was down and out, if I was broken, if I was just cast to the side, God would look directly at me and call me home. And I'm going to give this little girl the best summer of her life. Because right now, she doesn't feel loved. I remember she would come up to me and she would say, look at this picture I drew. And it would be a picture of her family. And I would say, oh, that's a really nice picture. And she would say, yeah, um, I really miss my dad. I wonder why I haven't heard from him in a while. And I would have to look her in the eye and just say, you know, I wish I could tell you something else, but we're here together, right? You're with Auntie Grisel, we're going to have a good time. And that was that compassion of Christ compelling me to look her in the eye and say, yes, your father may not be here to love you, but God loves you. That is that moment when I looked her in the eye and said, God is reaching out to you at the tender age of two and a half years old. Yes, you pee on my pillows on purpose, but at the same time... There's this God that loves you so much and is pouring into you right now. And so, um, after that, they really drew close to God. And this is why I know that no matter what you think you have, no matter who you think you are, no matter what you think you're good at or what you don't think you're good at, there's something that you can do to reach and change someone's life for God. Because you are, you are completely capable of it, even at this age. And so, another time that someone showed me compassion was someone named Kevin. If you could. Kevin! Aww. That's us at Bear, uh 2011. Um, that picture, though. So, um, I, <laughs> I met him at Bear, um we were both counseling at the time. I was counseling middle school, he was counseling high school. And I remember it was really hot, like on Sunday hot. How many of you guys were suffering on Sunday? 
Oh yeah, I feel you because that day was very hot. So when we had met, I was in the lounge or in the store and I was buying a bottle of water. And he just came up to me and started talking to me and he's like, what church are you from? I'm from SFCC. What are you doing? Are you a camper? Actually, no, I'm a counselor. Ha <laughs> ha. So, like, <laughs> so we, we had a talk and like it was a really good time. And, um, and he was just like, oh, what are you doing? And I was like, oh, I'm just buying a bottle of water. It's really hot. I'm really tired. And he looked at me and he said, okay. I was like, okay. And, uh, and he, like, okay, so this is me. Oh, this is me. And like, this is him. This is him. And then he goes, whoop. And like, whips out his wallet and he pays for my bottle of water. And I was like, what are you doing? And I was like, this is a, this is, yeah, chivalry is great, yes. And, but this is what he told me. <laughs> At first I was very confused and I was like, what are you doing? Why are you doing this? And he said, because I want to tangibly show you God's love. I want you to feel it and see it for yourself. And I was moved by this little act. In fact, so moved that like I talked about it today because his act of compassion sprung this huge act of compassion in me. So I began taking people out to dinner. I began taking people out for lunch. There's a story that I have of this one student who he, when he was younger, he got made fun of for not being, not wearing really nice clothes. And I remember, I was really upset about that. I was like, like, come on, it's fine. You can wear sweats everywhere, it's cool, you know? Um, and like, it was just really sad because I remember one day hearing from a friend that the same student said, man, I wish I knew what it was like to have nice clothes. And it broke Gary's heart and it broke my heart. Yes, this very same met Gary. And we spent hours shopping for this student. And then we were like, we don't want this student to feel like it's a charity thing. It is that deep, deep, it's blah. What is that? <laughs> <laughs> meets some that, that deep compassion that I felt for him. Because I just couldn't imagine what it was like to lose so much. Because he had not experienced a very good life. But to lose so much and to be made fun of so much and yet not have the opportunity to receive. And so we bought him all these clothes and then Gary and I wrote this letter and we were like, hey, this isn't a charity thing. This is a God thing. This is an I love you thing. This is us reaching into your life and saying, yes, clothes are super, super superficial, but at the same time, we understand that you're hiding behind them. We see you and we want you to know that you can be seen too. And so, from that moment on, we had many moments. And that very person is someone I love and respect today and is leading so many students, and I'm very proud of him. Um, so, another extension of compassion is just gift staff in general. Um, so, I did talk about this one time where I was very depressed in this sophomore year of college. And the reason being is because my sophomore year of college is when I was raped. Now, when I was raped, it was a very difficult time because I just kept blaming myself. And I kept saying to myself, like, you just deserved it. Because the very person that did it said to me, if you were, had you been conscious, you would have consented, and that was not true. And it was absolutely the worst moment of my life. And I remember how upset I was, how angry I was, all the compassion that I had been giving out had started to cease. And I remember just how broken I was because of just, when someone takes something from you when you don't say yes, it's not okay. It changes you. It makes you into a person who doesn't know how to experience things correctly, or it changes you from being so loving to being so held back. And I was so broken by that. 
and I just couldn't be compassionate. It was almost like I was this jar of like a person. And all of a sudden, this jar got capped and duct taped and then put in a box and then thrown into the ocean. And I just felt like I was so deep in that that God could not reach me. But that wasn't true. A few years ago, um, we had Dean Johnson speak. I don't know if you guys were there, but if you were there, then we do remember Dean Johnson. And he had a very powerful message about forgiveness. And I remember typically, you guys know me, like for those of you who know, I'm always up here with Erica or like all the other staff, and we're just out here praying. But that day, I just couldn't get out of my seat. Like I felt like literally that something was holding me back. And it was just this unforgiveness in my heart. And just the amount of compassion that people were like, it's not like, what's going on? You just don't seem like yourself. I'm like, yeah, because I'm not being compassionate. But I couldn't understand why. It was because there was unforgiveness in my heart. There was this bitterness in my heart. And it was just this brokenness that just overtook me. And I just couldn't face it. I couldn't look at dead in the eye because I was so hurt by it. And if you're so hurt by something, how can you ever face those things? Or how can you ever look at it again? But God was just pulling at me, pulling at me, pulling at me. And that night, I just couldn't take it. I was like, God, you're calling me. You want to meet me right now. And so I literally, like, dragged myself out and, like, crawled over to Auntie Carrie. And I latched onto her as you can see in this photo. And she was in that position for like, I don't know how long, like hours. And she was just listening to me weep uncontrollably. And I was just like, part of me was really guilty because like, I'm on staff, like I should be taking care of you guys. But I started to realize if I wasn't taking care of myself, if I wasn't showing that same compassion to myself, how on earth could I do that for you? And I was just praying and I was just, so broken and Dean was like, Chriselle, you need to say the name of every single person that you're forgiving right now. He made me go down the list. I forgave my rapist for raping me. I forgave my parents for giving me these huge expectations. I forgave my friends for when they hurt me. I forgave myself um, for just being so critical of myself and just not understanding my own healing process. And I forgave those who left me. I just started forgiving all these people. And all of a sudden, and <laughs> Uncle Craig was just so loving in that moment. I remember hearing him just like speaking these words over me and <clears throat> saying to me that there is just this darkness around you. And there was because of all the bitterness that was in my heart. And God is saying to you, if you have that bitterness in your heart towards someone, but that is keeping you from having this brilliant legacy. It is like having a painting vibrantly colored, but with a sheer black curtain over it. And that curtain is supposed to be removed. Because you are supposed to be free. For if the sun sets you free, you are free, free indeed. And so that's the life you should be living. And if you're living behind that black curtain, if there's this un forgiveness in your heart, this bitterness in your heart towards someone, God is calling you today to relinquish that, to release that. Because if you aren't doing that, there's a block. You are the jar with the duct tape in the box, thrown into the ocean. But you are never too far away for God to reach into you. And I know that, and I can feel that. And so, I just really feel for you. Whoever God is using me to talk to right now, I have been wanting to cry for you for this entire day because I know it's hard, because I know it's difficult, because I know you're suffering. But you can be free and that's okay. Be compassionate towards yourself so you can be compassionate towards others. You are a vessel that is to be filled and then pour it out onto others. And you can't do that if you cannot receive. So in this time, 
we are going to receive. And when as Josh comes up to play some songs, I'm going to come and just pray over you guys. If I could have the counselors and the staff come to the front, and we have this moment with God. Um, God, I just really lift up these students to you, Father. I just ask in this moment that you just be here with them, God. That those who are suffering from the unforgiveness in their heart, God, that you are going to free them, Father. That they entrust in you, Father, this life and this love for you, God, that they can be free. God, whoever is in fear right now, Father, I just pray over that right now, Father. Those who are living under high expectation, Father God, those who are broken by the expectation that they have had placed on them, God, I just ask that you just destroy that in Jesus' name, Father God. And Father, I just pray over the lies that some of these students are hearing, Father God, Lord. Some of them are hearing that they have no purpose, God. Some of them are hearing that they have no um, place in this world. But God, we know that there is a place for them because you are the one who created them, Father. And because of that, there is a place for them, Father. And so, Father, Lord, I just lift up all these people to you, Father, and I just ask humbly, Father God, Lord, that you just pour into them right now to this moment, that they are able to say, like, yes, I am okay to be not okay, but that doesn't mean that this is where I'm going to be. That I have more, that there is more, because there's this God who loves me and who chose me, And God, we just lift up these students to you, God. And we pray over them and we just ask for your guidance, God, that you give them the courage to stand, Father. The courage to stand up to their giants, Father God, Lord, and to face it and say, you have no power over me because God is over me. Yeah. And God, we love you and we thank you, Father. We thank you for who you are and what you're doing.